lots of sessions. This is our penultimate session of the conference, so we're almost there. Um, I'm delighted today that we're joined for this session by Jenny Osborne, OBE, no less. <laughs> um, Jenny is from TPAS, she's the Chief Executive at TPAS, um, and she's going to speak to us today about the importance of involving customers. TPAS is an organisation that some of you might have heard of, um, probably people in housing more than more than other colleagues, um, but they've long championed the rights of customers and tenants to have a say in the way that services are designed and delivered for them. Um, their work is centred around bringing together customers and organisations like us um, to shape services together. At Advance, I think we're, we all know how important it is to involve our customers um, and we've always placed customers at the heart of what we do. But there are regulatory changes happening at the minute across uh, social care and housing. Um, that means this is no longer just something that is nice to do or something that we want to do. This is now something that we must do um, and we must be able to evidence the way that we do it as well. Jenny will articulate all of this much better than I can in a moment. Um, but before we go over to Jenny, I'm also really pleased that Chris has joined us today. Um, Chris is one of our customers and he's going to speak just for a few moments about how he's involved with Advance and what it means to him. So Chris, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate you giving up your time. Thank you very much for having me, Louise. Hello, hello everybody. Nice to see you all this afternoon. Chris, can you just uh, introduce yourself first? Tell us a little bit about you. Yes, of course. Yeah, yes. My name is uh, Chris. I am a shared owner and volunteer with Advance Housing. I have been um, a shared owner for many years and came on the uh, since about 2008, but came on board with the volunteering a little a little later on down the line. So can you tell us what how you're involved with us, Chris? What are the things that you do with Advance? I have been, of course, I have been a volunteer in several inclusion projects within the organisation. These include the Advanced Collective. This is a monthly meeting about various topics which customers discuss and have guest speakers attend. Uh, the Advanced Customer Partnership. This is a meeting which takes place every quarter and involves both customers and the Advanced Board. They discuss what has gone well, what hasn't gone well, and what we need to do to improve things going forward. And finally, the complaints panel. This is a meeting which takes place every two months throughout the year, and we look at things such as figures, the number of complaints received and dealt with within the time frame, and the com complements, which we uh, complaints, sorry, which remain outstanding. And we're having that meeting on Friday, aren't we, Chris? <laughs> Our next one. <laughs> uh, yeah, next week, I believe, Louise. Yes, we are. We are. Yeah. Um, and why do you think it's important that customers can get involved? I believe, Louise, it is important for customers to be involved for various reasons. These are to give customers a voice. It, I believe it is important for customers to complain for various reasons. These are, um, as, I've, as I've just mentioned, to give them a voice. If they didn't complain, we as an organisation wouldn't know about the issue and therefore wouldn't be able to put things right. I think it is important to involve customers because it gives them the confidence that their concerns are being listened to and addressed in a professional manner. That's brilliant. Is there anything else you want to say to us? Um, Is that everything from you? Uh, no, I'm just, uh, I just have a, a look. I think that is everything. Thank you, Louise. No, I'm, 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 uh, I'm happy uh, that I've covered everything um, uh, today. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, Chris, and thank you for all you do, all your involvement um, and representing our customers on, on our various panels. It's really appreciated. So 
Okay, without further ado then, I will now pass over to Jenny, um, who will talk to us for the next 30, 40 minutes or so. Over to you, Jenny. Hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, lovely to be here today. I, uh, I'm going to just try and share my, my screen again, um, which uh, we tried earlier on and worked perfectly. So let's try and make sure that happens again. Oh, no, that's not working. Uh, stop sharing the hats. <laughs> We just tried this, didn't we? About one we minute. We did, ago. and it worked uh, perfectly. But uh, you know, why? <laughs> it worked. It absolutely <laughs> yeah. worked. It absolutely worked. Oh, this is ridiculous. Um, anyway, we will find it in a second. It will work itself out. I'm sure. Any any second now, and it'll get itself working. No, it's not. Let's try this way around. Have we got it now? There you go. You're yeah. 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 You're running. It gets there in the end, doesn't it, our team? Yeah. It gets there in the end, uh, which is always the, always the worrying bit. So thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to come and speak to you today um, uh, at your staff conference. Thank you uh, for joining me today. I really appreciate it coming along to listen. So I'm going to spend the, the, the next sort of half hour or so um, just taking you through kind of TPAS, who we are, um, and a little bit around kind of where the current kind of context is for what, you know, exactly what Louise just talked about and some of our thoughts as TPAS and myself about, you know, what we really think we're talking about when we're talking about resident influence, true resident influence in an organisation, that true resident voice. And I'm going to make the, the point right from the start. I'm going to interchangeably use the, the terms customer, resident, tenant. I, I flip between all three. Um, so just, you know, bear with me in different organisations. I know people use um, different terms, but I, I will uh, I will meander between all three and, and just forgive me um, for that. OK, so I just want to talk a little bit about TPAS. I won't spend too long on this, but I just wanted to, to, to talk about who we are, because I think many of you in the organisation, particularly in kind of not perhaps in, directly in the housing and part of the organisation, might not have heard of us. So we're Membership organisation. We've been around since 1988, not as long as yourselves, um, with your congratulations on your 50 years. Um, but what we are, we're a membership organisation um, and we work across England. And what we're here to do is bring tenants and landlords together. So we're a tenant and landlord organisation. And we're here to talk about tenant engagement, tenant empowerment, whatever terms you know people might want to use. And we fundamentally believe, why do you do tenant engagement in an organisation? Because if you bring tenants and landlords together, um, we can definitely find those solutions that will improve the services that tenants and customers receive. Absolutely unashamedly, I think it should be about driving kind of value for money, saving money. Um, but it's also about that lasting change to communities, which I'm sure all of you on this call are interested in and want to be part of. So we've got about 335 landlord members across the country um, and they range from, you know, very big housing associations, some of those big, very big housing associations that work across the country. Lots of local authorities are our members as well that have retained their housing stock and all the way to, to much smaller organisations of every of every kind. Um, and there are sister organisations across the other the other nations, but we predominantly work across England. So we've got 335 landlord members. And effectively, when we somebody joins us as a member, kind of the staff become members of TPAS, and so do all the customers of that landlord as well and can start to access our services and our support. And we've also got in our membership commercial members. And by that, I mean primarily um, contractors that are going out to work in people's homes, whether it be through a, a direct labour organisation, you know, an in-house repair service or whatever, or one of the contractors, people like Waits, Mayors, Vinci, these people you, you may have well have heard of. So they're in our family as well, because we know how important those people are to tenants when they're going in their homes. And so that's what we've been doing. And what we've been doing for years is championing that resident voice um, and we've had years when people have been really listening to us in government about that and we've had years when people have really not listened to us uh, both in government and in the sector we are in a in a different place i'm going to kind of just touch on that context over a couple of slides in, in a moment so i think that's really important to think about the, the journey where we've got to but i just wanted to share really kind of uh, just one major slide about tpas and what we stand for really which i think is really important over all of these years since 1988, of working constantly with thousands of tenants and customers, with thousands of staff, engagement staff in particular, people that are really working um, with, with tenants. 
we've created and we're on our fourth version now of our national engagement standards so these are t passes this isn't the regulator these are ours and these have been born from years of experience years of talking to people as i say and fundamentally what we say is you're going to do engagement right in an organization this is kind of what you need and at the heart of that is culture Culture, culture, culture of an organisation. I can't stress enough how important that is. And I know, in fact, you know, you say the word culture and sometimes it feels a bit, not quite sure what people mean by that, a bit nebulous. What, what do we mean by culture? But for me, how we describe it, it's about those right attitudes and behaviours. And it's about creating really meaningful, positive impact for people, which I know in spades that you do here at Advance. I, I know that. But it's about making sure that that right culture is embedded across the organisation. I've been to too many organisations in the past, I'll be honest, where I've seen a really great chief exec, someone that really buys into it. But actually, if you try and test throughout the organisation, it really hasn't gone through the organisation that people buy into doing engagement. So it's got to be valued and listened to um, engagement and what we say, what tenants are saying all the way through, particularly at kind of senior leadership level and governance level, but throughout all the teams in an organisation. And I think ultimately it comes down to trying to kind of simplify this for us all, I think, is, you know, what's the difference made, uh, the outcomes and impact from engagement? But we talk about what you need for engagement across seven themes. You know, these are the things you've got to put in place to get great engagement in an organisation, which I know you're doing and you'll want to go even further on. You know, things like um, scrutiny. In whichever form you might be doing that, how are we really scrutinising an organisation? Complaints, obviously, we've touched on that. It's already been mentioned uh, just by Chris, but I'll come back to complaints a little bit later on. Your information and communication, what resources do you put into engagement? You know, what training courses do people go on to? How big is the team that supports it, et cetera, et cetera. You get the picture. And under all of these are lots of different standards. So just, you know, if you want a sense of kind of where TPAS sets the bar on what we think great engagement looks like, and you know, to do urge you to go and have a look at this. These are our standards and, and I'll refer to bits of this as we go through. But I said I'd kind of come back and think a little bit about context, about why people like me are being invited to events like yours today. Why? Why, have we, why are we talking about this again um, at this moment in time? And I'm going to go through these quite quickly because I'm sure you, you know, many of you will have seen some of these. So just bear with me over the course of two or three slides. We've got you, um, obviously, in the, in the housing sector, we've got a regulator of social housing um, and a regulator of social housing that has been saying now since Grenfell and all the work that happened in the Green Paper and the White Paper and now the Act, been saying for years now, we have got to do more about listening to tenants. So we have a regulator that is telling us now as a sector that we've got to do more, that we fell short. In the past, you know, Fiona McGregor, their chief executive and all the, the team that were there, been very clear in saying to the sector, quite rightly over the last few years, we've not done enough in terms of listening and acting on tenants and we've got to do more. And well-run organisations have got to do more to take that prompt action about when tenants might, might um, safety might be compromised in particular, but also where their views aren't being taken into account. So we've got a regulator that is asking specifically for us to look at this, and that's been building and building, as you know, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But there's plenty of other people in the world in our in our housing sector that are also giving us the context for how we why we've got to step up to the plate and do more on this we've had the the review um, from dame judith hackett um, of building safety obviously in response to, to the grenfell fire we've got a whole building safety regulator now that's in the sector a very different world than we were pre um 2017 certainly We've got to be the building safety regulations under the health and safety executive. I was never talking about these people a few years ago. It just wasn't something we talked about. People we talked about in the house and we just we just didn't. Um, and of course, and I'm sure many of you are aware, obviously thinking about complaints and a housing ombudsman and a new housing ombudsman in Rick Blakeway from the last few years. I often use the word robust. We've got a very robust housing ombudsman now in the sector, an ombudsman that's really taking a very deep dive, really, um, you know, going after organisations to see how they're looking at their complaints um, and doing some really great stuff around spotlight reports uh, and looking at particular areas of dissatisfaction about complaints and how it's been handled across organisations. 
if you've read some of those, if you read the reports that come out of the, the housing ombudsman, there's some real horror stories in there. There's some really sobering things for us to be thinking about, about how, you know, over the years, but not just over the years, still today, organisations across the country, I'm not talking about advanced, you know, I'm talking about organisations across the country, how they are still dealing with complaints from tenants and things are getting stuck, stopped in the system. Um, and we've still got lots of work to do about complaints. We've got an, an ombudsman that's taken a real interest in our sector. We've also got people like Quajo. Again, you'll have, you'll have heard about Quajo, but you know, it's more than Quajo in terms of highlighting the conditions that we've had in social housing that perhaps weren't visible to certainly the wider public a few years ago. Social media generally, people are talking about what, what conditions they live in. Tenants have far more opportunities now already to have their voices heard and be able to participate at a national level with government um, and with the regulator. They have their own panel. So all these things are feeding in to an absolute change of culture across the sector to say we have to listen to tenants far more than we have been doing um, over the past few years. And of course, I've mentioned Grenfell already. The, the, the uh, report was published in September. I'm sure um, we've all read kind of some of the, the parts of that, if not the whole thing. And, and I just put, it's not come up very well, has it? But that whole web of blame, I don't know if you, any of you saw this, like this slide from the report around who was to responsible and it's almost kind of impossible to pick, you know, that apart, isn't it? And so I think that, again, speaks to this sense of culture that we've got in which multiple people have an impact in what happens in an organisation, both externally and internally. Um, and there's lots still to spit out of the, from the inquiry and from that report. The sector still digesting a lot of that. But we know the reason why we've got the regulatory changes that we've got now, we can directly trans, you know, take back to what happened in 2017. We're all, all aware of that. And of course, you as well, as advance, um, you are under other um, regulators and ombudsmen in the, the Quality uh, Care Quality Commission and the Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman. So, you know, you've got these others that are also in, in your mind. But there's some real read across, isn't there, I think, about of, of these regulatory schemes and the ombudsman, you know, looking at kind of the, the CQC, for example, talking about dignity and respect, all of these things. These, these are similar themes that play out also in the the regulator of social housing in terms of how do we treat people that are, that are living in, in our homes um, with the respect that they deserve and the accountability that we need to show our staff that, that work in those organisations. I just wanted to kind of hone in a little bit on the, the regulator of social housing because um, obviously that's the area that I'm uh, most dealing with and, and working with and what we've got, what came into play on the 1st of April, again, sorry, many of you will be aware of this, I know, but um, 1st of April in 2024, early this year, was this new um, standards, uh, regulation standard, consumer regulation. And it's covering kind of four standards, safety and quality, stuff around homes, obviously, and safety, quite right, big thing. Neighbourhood and community standard, tenancy standard, you know, how do we let homes, or all of this. But the one that's obviously of most interest to me as, as Chief Executive of TPAS is the tenants, the transparency influence an accountability standard and that's the one that's really driving now the change that we're looking to see in the sector and what you as advance and those of you every one of you that work in in advance need to be mindful of in terms of meeting that new standard and, and how you'll be judged on it i'm not going to go into all the detail of it it's not uh, it's not for today to do all of that but i just wanted to highlight some of the you know the things that it's in there and i'm sure many of you are aware of it but it's again going back to this word respect how does it, it appears in so many kind of regulatory things now? We must treat all tenants and prospective tenants. Great to see that there with fairness and respect. Lots of talk about diverse needs and meeting diverse needs. And how do we know what those needs are? And again, this sense of action, this word action really appears a lot more in this regulatory world that we're now living in. Prompt action, fast action. Um, this sense that if you know something, if you know there's a need out there, you have to deal with it, not just know it. You have to do something about it. And that's quite a kind of change in, in kind of in way that's that's described. Um, must take tenants' views into account. It's about how your service is delivered. And again, I've worked on RDC, I've looked on your website, I've heard from Chris this morning. I know you're doing that in many places, but how do we take that even further? And how do we, and I'll talk in a minute, but how do we articulate that even more than perhaps we all have been doing across the sector? 
information communication i don't think i'm sure you're the same as me i don't think i go to many meetings with tenants across this country where communication isn't flagged up as one of the problems in the in the organization i mean it just always is isn't it we've got to do more about that and providing that information that enables your customers across their brands to really be able to genuinely challenge you so not information that's provided at such a level that it's meaningless and um, it doesn't allow for it or it's deliberately kind of obtuse that nobody would be able to interrogate it and understand it we've seen all examples of that over the over the years here we see complaints talked about again you know we've got to ensure complaints are addressed fairly effectively and promptly and this link between the housing ombudsman and the regulator of social housing is absolutely key now Regulator of social housing is looking at kind of organisational issues with, an, with somebody like Advance. The housing ombudsman will deal with the, the complaints that come individually from customers of Advance, but they share information and talk to each other about what a lot of complaints might be indicating about an organisation. And then obviously we've got people and many people across the sector are now self-referring because they've realised that they've got issues in their in their organisations that they've not addressed. And the main ones, again, you'll probably be aware, will are around safety, about understanding who lives in our home and doing some of the compliance stuff around gas, safety, asbestos, whatever they may be that haven't been electrical safety is the big one that people haven't been doing over the last few years. So we've got a very robust regulatory environment now that we have to work under and, and I'll be honest with you all when I've talked about engagement over the years I've been talking about it a lot <laughs> um, I've always talked about it in, in sort of three ways why would you do engagement why bother and for me there's always been three reasons and um, why would you do engagement in a, in a housing organization well one it's absolutely should be about driving improvements in services business plan bottom line Doing good engagement helps your business plan, helps you deliver better value for money services. I firm believer in that. I think there's always been a personal aspect to it. Getting people involved. There's a there's a spin off that happens around in terms of customers confidence, people that might start to gain skills that they can use in jobs in other ways. It's about that community benefit of people coming together in communities, talking to each other. There's always been that kind of what I would call personal community reason to have good engagement practices in your organisation. And what's been missing for the last few years, though, is the third part of the triangle, which was regulation why we should do it and we finally got that back again and that for me completes the reason why every organization whichever floats your boat more why we should do engagement and what's happening now obviously again i want them to the details of this i'm sure you know this is that the regulator of social housing is now coming out and doing inspections on these consumer regulation um, standards. So they're coming out, they're doing the first wave of inspections are already, have already been done, they're on their website. So we're already starting to see organisations across country getting some of these um, judgments and they're graded C1 to C4. I think um, we've been sort of a little bit surprised at how many we've seen get a C1. And we were being prepped by the sector, uh, from the sector a little bit to say, don't expect too many C1s. Um, you know, you're not all going to be there. But actually, we've seen quite a few, which is great. And we've seen some, some. I think the regulator, from the things I've heard from them already, have been pleasantly surprised about how ready the sector have been for a lot of this, which is great. Shows we've all been listed over the last few years. And often getting a C2 is just because you've got weakness in perhaps one area of the standards. And generally that's seeming to be around the kind of data stock condition kind of standard in particular. But we're also seeing, you know, pushback on some of the stuff around tenant engagement. But we're into that regime now and that is great. And we're going to have to all just sort of wait to see how we see a few more coming through to start to pick up some patterns and some more learning we can take from that. But which is where we're at, we're at as a sector. But even with those first few coming through and even before this started in April, what were we as TPAS, but also the regulator, what were we already seeing organisations struggle with? And this is for me where we try and sort of take this back to a bit more reality of what we're doing day to day, all of us that, that work in organisations. And I think, you know, it feels I'm sure some of you might be looking at this as a very simplistic slide, but I think we're still back to the sector still struggling sometimes between the difference between an output and an outcome. 
And when you relate that to engagement, that's because what we want to see is better outcomes for tenants. And what we've not been able to do is always demonstrate that or show that and certainly not be able to evidence it. And what do I mean by that? Let's just take that on a little bit further. So I think if you if you went back a few years, and maybe still in some organisations, it's still happening, people would talk about, oh, I've got, you know, we have key tenants engaging with us. They get, they get involved. They participate in something. They do a survey. So therefore, they're participating. They're, they're engaged with us um, and they've been involved. Big tick. Brilliant. I suppose where we're at now is an even more simplistic slide I'm going to share you with. That's really just around inputs. People participating is an input. Getting, being engaged and involved, it's just an output. It's not an outcome. Nothing necessarily has changed with that. It's a so what? And I love a so what question. So what? So what doing that? What has that changed for anybody, for the customers that we work with? I'll try and describe it in another way. Um, let's take today, for example. Well, there's, I don't know how many on the call, 40, 50 of you on the call today. You're listening. You're participating already. You're already here. You're participating in a session because you're listening to me. Some of you may get even more engaged later. You may ask a question or you may pop something in the chat. Some of you may go off and have a look at TPAS website and think about some of the things I've been saying. But if all that happens today is you've turned up to a meeting and somebody's taught and then you walk away, go back to your desk and your jobs tomorrow to this afternoon and do nothing different as a result of it, then all we've stayed in is an output situation. There's been no real change. Nothing has changed as a result of what you being engaged here today. We want to see something change and happen. They might, that might be, from my perspective, like say you download some resources, you join as a member, whatever it might be. Otherwise, basically what I'm going to do is probably go to my chair tomorrow in my one to one and go, oh, get me. I spoke to 50 people at Advance yesterday. Aren't I great? Didn't I do well? Haven't I done something great? But actually, if nothing changes, nothing happens from that. I've not impacted any of you in any way by what I say. I've literally just spoke to 50 people and nothing has changed. And I think if you try and apply that thinking to some of the meetings that we've all been part of with customers and tenants across the sector over the years. We've all been guilty of that, haven't we? We've thought because 50 people have turned up to a, an away day and a state meeting, that that's great. We've done engagement and actually nothing has changed. I don't want to keep hammering the point, but I think it's really important that we think about numbers is not the most important thing. It's about the real influence of change services. So it's that sense of when we use the term resident influence, customer influence, tenant influence, we're talking about two things, that really proactive engagement of residents, of, of customers. So, you know, complete a survey, make a complaint is very proactive engagement or engages in one of your groups, in the collective, in the partnership, whatever it might be. But more and more, we need to now be thinking about that influence that comes from our customers that maybe not be as so overtly proactive or conscious this is where you're noticing things as an organisation without having your customers having to tell you because uh, your data is telling you something, for example, or even your data is not telling you something. Why do we never hear from those people in that group of houses, on that stay, in that scheme? Why don't we? That's interesting. Have we sat as a sector too long and thought because people aren't complaining or aren't engaged with us, that means everything's OK? And actually, what we've got now is a regulator and an ombudsman. They say that you can't live with that mantra. Basically, you need to be looking far more into your data, into what's coming into your contact centre, into what you're hearing on the ground and building that as well into your real true resident influence. And I use a slide here regularly. I've used a slide for, for a few years now, but I still think it resonates. It's from a book by Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. And I think particularly I use this slide main, you know, more with boards sometimes when I'm talking to boards of, of organisations. Because have we, but it you know, gives you pause to reflect as well, have we been guilty too many times of, list, of thinking too literally about hearing customer voices? Do we, when we talk about, we must hear the customer voice. Do we really think when we think of that, I mean, a customer sat next to me in a meeting or a customer that I'm having a one to one chat with? It's that customer voice. Is that what we think? You know, and that's probably natural that many of us do. And have we as a sector, um, in particular, I'm still challenging the sector, been 
at risk of listening only merely to those customers that have been very engaged or involved with us? Have we had a group of, you know, whatever number, let's say, let's take 100 very involved customers that are on two or three of our panels or we talk to or we always ring up or we get in and think, oh, those panels are working brilliantly. But we're actually only talking to a very small part of our customer base and asking them the same, you know, questions about services all the time. And the example I give, and again, apologies if any of you think this is a bit of a trite example, but I think it still stands true. The example I give is an organisation when looking at the letters they sent out about rent arrears um, and they got a group of customers together to have a look at that and have redesign it and say, you know, not having the impact that we thought it might have. But actually, when we when we were working with them, not one of the customers that helped redesign that letter had ever been in rent arrears. So you've got people designing a letter that have never been in that situation, have never, will never have been the kind of people that would never not pay their rent. They would never, they would be horrified to think they didn't pay their rent. They've never been in that situation of opening that letter, how it feels to open that letter when you're already in a really, really um, vulnerable or, you know, really in poverty, whatever it might be. How does it feel to open that letter? Why do people not even open the letter, for example? So we were asked, we've been asking people sometimes the wrong questions, the wrong people, the wrong questions. We need to ask the people that are going to receive the service or the aspect of the service we're talking about. What do you think? How we can approve it? Not expect all customers to know the answer to everything or have insight because we can create real bias by doing that can't we and that the also the risk of just focusing on a very very narrow area and we need to be thinking and, and the regulator talks about this about the people that will use our services in the future and I, I know at advance you, you will be doing much more on this and other organizations I, I see how are we thinking about the services that people want in the future and again you can't always get that insight or thought just by talking to current customers in their situation. We've got to think wider than that as an organisation. Hopefully, I might be able to just give you a sense. Actually, it actually moved on. Let's just see why that won't move on. There we go. Um, how this could play out. And this is how, how what we use at TPAS, really conscious of time. This is how it plays out at TPAS, trying to just give people a sense of how, well, how does this play out? How do I do more than just the formal stuff, Jenny, that perhaps many organisations have been used to? And we use this pyramid here to try and, and help organisations. Because I'll be honest with you, I go to a lot of organisations where it still feels a bit of a numbers game. Jenny, how can I get more people involved? How can I get, you know, more people, more young people involved, whatever it might be? And actually, what I say is every single one of your customers is already involved with you. They're already they're in this be aware segment, as we call it. They're, they're aware of you because you're their landlord. They pay you rent. They have compliance visits. They have repairs happening most people once a year or whatever. So they already know who you are. They might be reading your newsletters. They're certainly probably looking at your website at some point over the year. They might be following your social media. Every single customer in advance is already in your engagement framework in this be aware section. And that's where every single one of them will be. Different levels, but they'll be in there. So you've already got your numbers game. The deal is making sure that what you put in that be aware section around the newsletters, the website, social media, whatever it might be, is the best it can be. I know the regulator is doing what we do when we go in to look at organisations. We're going to the website first. What is the website doing with an organisation? Is it does that speak to who you are as an organisation? Does it really represent your culture? Is it open? Is your complaints information on there? I've been on your website. It's good. You know, I'm not I'm not criticising, but you know, again, it's about saying to if I was a customer that wanted to either complain, is it easy to do so? If I'm a customer that wants to get involved, is it easy for me to do so? And those are the things that you know, us as TPAS and the regulator are looking for because it's a real indicator about whether you're giving everybody in that be aware section the opportunity to be engaged and aware of you as an organisation. You can see what's happening here when I'm going to talk about with this pyramid. As you go through the pyramid, less and less people will be engaged and involved. And that's totally fine. Some people will say, you know what, I'm out what we call opt in. Go on then. You know, I will fill in a survey for you. All right. Yeah, go on, put my name down. But I don't want to do anything else. But I'll just do this one. And that's might be all they ever do. And that's absolutely fine. That's good. You've got to take that, use it, do something with it. 
people might opt then as we go into that kind of chip in session to actually complete the survey they might contribute on social media they might start to attend some of your local meetings and that's brilliant and again they may do no more than that they may never want to be involved any more than that so how do you make that brilliant how do you make sure when they're coming along to those things that you're hearing that all that contributing to social media for example or surveys is it just going nowhere or is somebody in advance picking that up and saying, you know what, I'm being proactive here. I'm thinking about what people are saying on that. It's not a formal meeting. It's not a formal kind of, you know, panel. But people, are, our customers are telling us something. We're hearing something here. And we need to grab that in that chipping section. Because generally, customers, in my experience, will not do more in the other bits that you perhaps might want them to come along to. The co-create bits, the collaborate, the being on committees unless these other things are really good and they can see that you're taking notice of these things. So really focusing on these things that you most of you will be doing. How are you hearing things and have you got channels to communicate it back to people? And as you get nearer the, you know, the top of the pyramid, fewer people might be involved and that's OK. That's absolutely fine. Some organisations prefer to use the diagram the other way around because sometimes it can feel like it's creating a hierarchy you use it in everywhere any way you want to um, and or not at all it, it works both ways whichever way you want to use it and again you can just i'm just flagging up here very quickly just how that might play out in a different way you know thinking about it you've got residents all residents chipping in being aware opting in they're giving you evidence they're giving you insight um, and then you've got your groups over on the right hand side your more formal groups your collective etc they're not only looking at that insight but they're generating their own evidence and doing things and making recommendations and i think what we're trying to get to ultimately in all of this is we want to get people engaged in stuff that's interesting, attractive, really relevant to them. That's absolutely key. Let's not keep banging stuff out. I say to the sector, stuff to every single customer you might have, thinking they're all going to be interested in the same thing. We're all not. We're all human. We all want different things. Knowing your customers means you can give them stuff that is interesting, attractive and relevant to them, which is more likely to lead to them wanting to get involved. And that will be really much more appropriate. It'll be you want to make sure your involvement stuff is outcome led because then we're going to this influence that we're talking about and we're popping it all in. I kind of described this as a little hopper. If you've got your data coming in, you've got your curiosity as staff members. What, what, what do I need to know here? What are people telling me? Popping that in. You've got your customer experience coming in. They've been involved and engaged. Pop that in. And what that gives you is something really valuable to say, oh, I've got something useful here we can do something with. And that point about a rapid response that links back to the regulator wanting things to happen far more quickly than they used to do. Very, very quickly, I just pop that up as a kind of example of another organisation that's kind of, this is um, for housing. That's how they sort of interpreted our pillar. They've done it in slightly different ways, pop different things in there. Um, so that local initiatives, that talking to people at a local level, that's gone under their engagement pillar. The stuff, the more formal stuff around scrutiny, that's in a different one. It's just there to give you a sense of how people interpret it. And I suppose really I just wanted to kind of on the final few slides is just talk to you about what we're seeing from organisations across the sector, how they react to this. And some of this you will be doing. There's a real focus on scrutiny or tenants and customers really getting involved in scrutiny and doing things in a very different way, focusing on the key things that matter to them. And obviously we've been seeing a lot of scrutiny at the moment on damp and mould in particular because that's been a key topic. Lots of complete and really critical restarts on engagement structures. Lots of people starting from scratch, recognising things haven't worked. And that can be difficult for both staff and tenants that are involved in the organisation, but many organisations doing that. We're seeing a return, just to give you a flavour of the sector, of tenants going back on boards. So a lot of housing association boards start having tenants on boards. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. TPA has to take a kind of more neutral view on that, but we're definitely seeing that across the sector. We're seeing much more this sense of customer assurance panels in governance structures. And what I mean, people call them slightly different things, but certainly in many of the kind of the large, mid to larger ones, we're seeing a subcommittee of the board with equal status to say your governance and risk or your audit and risk organize, um, subcommittee of a board real kind of similar kind of powers really looking at things that matter to customers complaints in particular so a subcommittee of the board that's really focusing on what the customer facing policies that really impact their day-to-day -day lives seen a lot of that um starting we're helping with a lot of that 
we're seeing across some you know organizations engagement as a business partner so the engagement team is a business partner so the engagement team who are all you know specialists really helping other parts of the business we're seeing people rethinking the policy timetable what i mean by this is seeing too many boards that are in a and a cycle of things going to the board. Oh, we've got to do this policy. This policy's got to go to board in November. Oh, damn it, we've not spoke to anybody about it. Oh, quick, let's do a focus group. And then we can say that we've spoken to customers. We need to stop doing that as an org, as a sector. Really rethink about if something's going to board, something that's going to change how you do things as an organisation, have you given proper time to involve customers all the way through in helping shape it, really be thinking about that. Definitely a refocus on community work and a definitely this focus on understanding diverse needs far more. That was just an example of a kind of how scrutiny is raising up in, in many organisations and we're doing lots of work to recruit people differently. My last couple of slides, I promise, Louise. Um, all of this links, I think, really around coming back to a word I think is so important. I talked about culture being a word that's important, but trust. Again, when you talk to tenants society across this country, one of that word comes up time and time again. It's about trust in the organisation. It's such a powerful relationship, particularly yourselves as a, with advance as well. And it's you know there's a, there's a model there that you can you can obviously be, be reading. But how do we really start to demonstrate trust? What are some of the things that we should be doing as organisation? Have we got a listening plan? Are we really thinking about how we're doing that? I know you do this at advance, but really bringing that customer experience to life, making sure all parts of the business hear that experience in various ways, really evidencing customer report of voices. Things like unvarnished visits, I and mean, there's always the big joke, isn't it, about the Queen used to say she only ever went to places and it smelled of newly, uh, uh, freshly painted paint. It's, it's an old sort of statement, isn't it? But I think you can take that to, to housing sometimes, can't you? You know, we need board members, senior leaders going and seeing things as they really are. And, and that's OK. We should be doing more about that because it builds trust with our customers really need to be thinking about some of our early warning systems and i think some of the best early warning systems are our you know frontline staff because they're seeing and hearing things day in day out they're they're the best and boards senior leaders that aren't listening to frontline staff i hate the phrase but i can't think of a better one at the moment are missing a real trick you're hearing seeing things day in day out that should have a way to be fed in as that kind of noticing proactive listening to tenants leadership's got to drive all of this um, and your complaints culture. I'm not a fan of talking about, oh, we should welcome complaints and, oh, aren't complaints great? That isn't how I would describe it because a complaint means that a tenant somewhere is unhappy with something. But what I do think we should be is kind of when we've got complaints is really dealing with those properly, not trying to, you know, can I get rid of them in any way? Actually saying there's something here too we can do with this and learn from this and seeing it in that valuable way. Deal with the complaint itself is one part of it and that should be done right. But also what's the learning as well? And I just want to leave sort of a couple of questions with you really now as, as, as advance. If we took the organisation's existing pulse, if I took that, what ways would it be clear that the customer voice is being heard and already influencing decisions? Some have been mentioned today. But is there more that we could be doing? Um, and can you articulate it? If the regulator had landed today and said and came and talked to some of you, could you really demonstrate and bring to mind easily some of the outcomes where tenant influence have really changed services, where the customers have really brought something to your notice or you've noticed things? and our service has changed and improved as a result. We need to have that evidence both at our fingertips and as part of our DNA and as our evidence that we can give to the regulator. It won't be good enough to just say, oh, this is our structure. Have a look. That won't wash with them. You've got to prove what's changed and how it's working. And I think that's just a question around existing culture and behaviours. What are they um, here at Advance? That's the customer and practice that really feeds into hearing the tenant experience. And how certain are you that you are seeing everything you need to see and that those experiences are influencing your services that you provide individually as a staff member, but as a collective as well? So I think I'll just leave you with the question of how do you know that advance is really listening, hearing, understanding and acting? Because they're all quite different things. How are you making sure you're doing all of those? And to make sure you're doing all of those, what might you need to be thinking about that needs to change? Thank you for listening. Um, I hope that was, was useful. 
That's absolutely fantastic. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I know we are tight on time, but does anyone have any sort of quick questions they want to pose? Lots, lots of uh, good comments in the chat, so that's good. Um, if people do have questions and want to sort of like pass them on to me after the session, I'm sure Jenny uh, wouldn't mind coming back to us uh, on some of those, and um, that'd be fantastic. Um, it is such an important area and something that we all need to be thinking, whatever our roles in the organisation, you know, Let's not leave customer engagement to the customer engagement manager, which is Jackie. It's one person. This is about each and every person in the organisation understanding the importance. And as Jenny says, making this part of our DNA. So loads to think about. I think we're already on the journey, but lots more for us to do. Um, and thank you, Jenny, for bringing that to life for us. Really appreciate it. Thanks all. And looking thank forward you. to seeing you at the, uh, the final session, the Pride Awards, uh, in just over an hour's time. So see you all there. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Bye.